I am back on my bullshit. Welcome back everyone. Today I want to talk about the woodwind library I just demonstrated, but I also want to generally talk about the future of sampling. Um, I'll put the piano sheet music to this piece up on Buy Me A Coffee along with the MIDI of this uh, session, if you're interested in having a look at it. As you know, I don't do a lot of sample library reviews anymore. It's a lot of work and it's not really financially worth it. Um, it. I'd be better off just buying the product, taking the tax deduction, and then writing music with the product and making money that way. So I turn down developers all the time if I'm not really interested in the product or I don't really see myself using it because I don't want to just make a review to make a review. I want to review stuff that I actually stand behind and that I would recommend to people and that I'm actually using on commercial products. There are three ways for me to be interested in something. Uh, one, the product does the same thing as everyone else, but it does it better. Like Cinematic Studio Series, for example, would be for me a good example of that. Um, they're not doing anything fundamentally different, but I think personally for my workflow, they're doing the same thing, but better. Or two, the product is really creative. I've mentioned orchestral tools in this context. I've mentioned uh, Project Sam, Heaviosity. There's a bunch of companies that are focusing a lot more now on making artistic stuff that is inspiring and new and hybrid or texture based or anything like that. And that's what I'm interested in as well. Or it's brand new technology that tries a different way of doing things. And that is where acoustic samples comes in. Their main flaw, of course, is that they're French and it loads into the UVI player, which is free, but it's also French. My people really need to get their shit together before the French take over. What kind of world would that be? A world of wine and cheese. I figure we might as well go all the way over here if we're gonna go French, right? I got some wine from Sancaire. I was trying to get a Sauterne uh, dessert wine, but they didn't have that. So I was trying to get a non-acidic Bordeaux. They didn't have that either. That's what I get for trying to shop right before Thanksgiving. But so the gentleman at Trader Joe's said, worry not, my lady, you will like this one. So we'll put that to the test right now. Ooh, it's like one of those expensive ones that is dry but still tastes sweet because it's quality. Go Trader Joe's. I also got my favorite cheese, Comté and Port Salut. And Cantal, if anybody living in LA knows where to get Cantal, um, Trader Joe's had it for like one summer as a special, but never again. And I've been looking everywhere. We must have some kind of specialty cheese store that has Cantal. Um, but I developed my uh, love for French cheese because we were vacationing in France every year, either in the Bordeaux area or in uh, Perpignan. So it was cheese time all the time. Anyway, follow for more amateur opinions about wine and cheese. So let's get into sample modeling history. Um, sample modeling has been around for a while. I remember using it at least 10 years ago. It was just okay then. It wasn't great. The problem was always with the sound, which always felt a little bit too stale or a little bit too synthetic. Um, you could hear what instrument they were trying to emulate, but it was never just quite convincing. Another thing is the room, because naturally uh, sample modeled instruments are gonna be super dry, kind of like that first woodwind library from VSL. And so you have to, you know, put it in a room with delay and reverb and uh, EQ and all this stuff, which can be a lot of work, especially if you're not a professional, you don't know how to do that, can be complicated. And there was also always a problem with doubling, because if you wanted to have like, say two clarinets play the same line, um, but there was only one clarinet available, you couldn't really do that. Because if you layer them on top of each other, either you just get double the volume, um, 
or you get uh, phasing. So either way, it didn't work. I do also have the sample modeling strings. I might get into those at some point, but um, they have all the functionality, but it's the same issue where the sound just isn't quite there. But I always thought it would be cool if it worked. I mean, it would be the ultimate control over anything, right? So acoustic samples, the V winds that I just demonstrated, um, they solved that sound issue by um, creating a hybrid approach whereby they use some samples and then they mix that with sample modeling. Kind of like, um, think about it like uh, the Liquid Sonics reverbs where it and their fusion IR technology. Um, would actually be cool if they work together. Um, but so they uh, maintain the flexibility of sample modeling while merging it with real samples and it creates this thing that is new that I've never had before and it's fun and it, it has so many advantages. I'll get into it in, in a, just a moment. So one advantage is that you can have everything on one track. All the articulations are in the instrument because you're playing it as if you're playing a real instrument. So if you know my videos, you know I'm usually splitting out articulations to compensate for weaknesses in the library, volume differences, negative track delay differences, all this stuff. You don't have to do that with this. You can just have every, if you want staccato, you play staccato. If you want legato, you play legato. If you want a trill, you play a trill, you know? Like you don't have to trigger a run sample. You just play the run that you want to play. You don't have to trigger audio files. So you just play a line. This must also be glorious for orchestrators who no longer get 500 tracks from me, but just one track. Um, and they don't have to puzzle it together. So this is so much faster in my workflow, just programming any line or just playing it in. Um, this is gonna save me a lot of time for sure in my workflow. And I'm all for that because if I can do the same thing faster, that means my hourly rate goes up, right? Because I can now do the same thing in less time. Um, no more negative track delay because there is none. Glorious. <laughs> Love not dealing with that. Um, you have 100% flexibility. I'll get into the interface in just a second um, to show you exactly all the things that you can control, um, which is way more than you can control in any other library. It's really light on RAM and SSD space. In fact, let me, let me look this up. Okay, so I have all the oboes and English horns loaded, and it's 115 MB of RAM. Let me take a look at the clarinets. It's 300 MB of RAM. Like this whole, all these woodwinds maybe come close to a gigabyte of RAM, maybe 1.5. That's wild. And then what's the footprint on the hard drive? Let me go into my hard drive and see. 2.5 gigabytes. 2.5 gigabytes for two oboes, two English horns, one, two, three, four clarinets, basset horn, two bass clarinets, contrabass clarinet, two bassoons, and a contrabassoon. 2.5 gigabytes. That's nothing compared to other woodwind libraries. So super light on the system, super light on the hard drive space. There's no room buildup, which is always an issue with traditional libraries, especially the ones recorded in big halls. Uh, the moment you use multiple patches, the room is going to double itself over and over. There's a way to compensate for that by denoising the samples, but then you run the risk of the samples becoming stale and you're removing the expensive room that costs you a lot to record. So it's a whole thing. You don't have that problem here because there's no room on it. So no room buildup. Updates, super easy. I think just while I was trying out these instruments, they sent me like three updates. And it's really easy because you're just downloading a 300 MB file and you're like replacing it and that's it. That is the easiest updates <laughs> that I have ever done on anything. And they keep updating things. They keep tinkering with it, improving it. Now, another nice thing that you can do with this is you can um, do different genres of music. Now, I 
showed the more cinematic approach because that's what I do. And I kind of felt like that was missing a little bit in their demos, um, in their showcases. So there's that blending with all these other libraries that I have. But if you go to Simon Passmore's channel, let me actually show you that one. Highly recommend subscribing to his channel. Here it is. And so he did a big band test. Let's listen to that. It's just using acoustic samples. Like, I wouldn't have known that this isn't real if I didn't know. Maybe the jazzers among you can hear it, I don't know. But uh, if this were on in the background, I wouldn't question it. Um, and he also did another mock-up um, of a Bach sonata for woodwinds. So counterpoint is possible with this as well. Let's listen to that. and so forth. Subscribe to his channel and listen to the whole thing. Um, the nice thing I find about his channel is that he um, he's a very good example of someone who has very few libraries, very few, you know, production means in his arsenal, but who really learns his tools and makes them work. Like I've heard him make way better mock-ups with like four libraries, then I've heard other people make mockups who have a hundred libraries. Um, so really good example of someone who can make very few tools work to his advantage because he actually spends the time learning stuff. And he was the one who also tipped me off um, to this library. Because when I first heard about it, I was like, oh, I don't need another woodwind library. Um, and then Simon was like, this is different. And so I looked into it and I was like, oh, it is. <laughs> so thanks. <laughs> now the disadvantages are for me are the decision-making fatigue that I sometimes get while using it. Um, I'll show you the interface in a moment and what I mean by that, but you really have to know what sound you want and maybe also a little bit understand how an instrument is played idiomatically because you have to make a lot of performance decisions. Um, and I think that might be difficult. Like even I'm questioning myself still, like after this demo, I'm still like, I don't know if I made the right choices um, or if I should have picked a different mic position or made the key noises louder or softer or this or that, or had the instruments closer or further. It's, it's very, because you have so much choice and it's very easy to apply. It's not like you have to do a lot. It's just like, do I like this more or do I like this more or do I like this more? And it's, it's just difficult to decide for me because I never had the choice. And so now I'm like, I like all of them. <laughs> what do I do? So I keep questioning myself. And they're also still working on the flutes to finish the woodwind section. Où sont les flutes, Arnaud? Je ne peux pas travailler comme ça. Where's my emotional support wine? Here we go. Some people have pointed out that I am uh, too mean to the French in my videos, and I disagree. I don't think I'm mean enough. Europeans just like to take the piss out of one another. It's like sibling energy between us. Like, we want to hurt each other, but also not, but a little bit. After the flutes, I really hope um, 
we'll get the most amazing strings we've ever seen. Pas de pression, Arnaud. Now let me walk you through the interface. Let's do the clarinets, because the clarinets are new. They just came out. This clarinet one, this is the UVI workstation. Um, I have the multi-loaded here. Uh, it works like contact, basically, here. You assign the outputs, yada yada. Clarinet one, so here you have CC1 that is controlling the dynamics. And then you have CC11, which is controlling the vibrato. Now there's different ways to control the vibrato. I have this one set to auto time because clarinets don't generally play with a lot of vibrato in classical context or cinematic context. But you can set it to auto, in which case there's no curve applied to the pre-made curve applied to the legato, uh, the vibrato. Right. With the other one, there's like a, a pre-made curve that fades in and out, kind of pre-applied. Or manual, this is kind of for when you have a uh, controller that has like aftertouch kind of thing where you can play the vibrato. Or if you have a breath controller, this doesn't really work with a fader. Because um, this creates pitch different, like, listen to this. Right? It creates a, a pitch shift the way it would in a vibrato, but you can't really do that with a with a fader. Uh, so this instrument I have set to auto time. Other instruments I've set to auto. And then with this one, you create you can control the virtual space. Then you have the mix page. Here you can decide which microphone you want or which microphone combination you want because you can obviously mix these in however you want. I usually keep the closest mic, but so this is what this sounds like right but you also can choose the one in the middle you're kind of also hearing my reverbs on this maybe I should turn those off or you have mic 3 which is a little further away but so yeah I leave it on the first one I don't know if that's the right choice. I don't know if there is a right choice. I, I'm i still debating. There's an EQ that you can apply in here. I have it applied on my output, but whatever you want to do is fine. And then you have these two things. So this one is controlling the virtual space, and this one is creating uh, is controlling the dry signal, reverb, decay, yada, yada. You can pick the reverb type. Um, and how much of the dry signal you want versus the virtual space signal. So if you go to the next page, you can see the virtual space. And you can um, put this into any space. Let me actually turn off the close mics and just have the virtual space playing. That This signal gets fed into this signal, basically. Um, so let's do this. Let me just play through this line that I have here. And then I'll click on different positions so you can hear the clarinet move around. But you also have mic pair type, like these two mics that you see in the front. I chose A, B, but you can also choose O, R, T, F. So you get these four types. And then also you can decide the room size and stereo width. On some instruments, I want the full stereo width because it sounds good. On others, I kind of just put it to 50%. Again, it's kind of a creative choice. Like there's no right or wrong here. But so for this, I put the clarinet here, I believe. I put that 
for all of them because they're all playing a solo. Um, you could obviously put it further in the front, but so what I did was instead of doing that, I put the clarinet really far away for this, and then I um, mixed that in 100%, and then I chose the close mics and dialed them in, I think to minus eight dB. Some of them I have at minus six dB, some of them I have at minus 10, depending on how much detail or closeness I want from the instrument. But so this is kind of what I find difficult to make the choice of where do I want the instrument, how close do I want it, how much of the close mics do I want versus how much of the virtual space do I want. It's like you could just use the virtual space and then pull the instrument to the front. Anyway, so this is kind of the page that I spent the most time with because I couldn't decide what I wanted. And then you have preferences here. So much choice. You can decide how loud you want the key clicks, tongue, how much airflow noise you want, uh, pitch variation, how much of that you want. You can choose the vibrato speed that you're controlling in the front. This is the curve I was talking about with the auto vibrato that it was applying if you choose that option. How strong the vibrato is, the, the pitch modulation of the vibrato. Then also this the tuning of the instrument and how precise the instrument is. Like I actually opted for a little bit of pitch variation because no player would be playing perfectly, especially at the, um, you have here attack pitch variation and attack pitch variation time, which means the top of the note, usually woodwinds, brass, actually any instrument, singers as well except for like stuff with definitive pitch like piano. Any instrument that ha doesn't have definitive pitch has this moment of, you know, kind of gliding a little bit into the pitch where it, it may not hit the perfect pitch right away and then the player corrects it after like a millisecond. Um, so you can even control that here. I have not even touched all of these uh, timbre variation and all this stuff. But so this is what I mean by decision-making fatigue because there's so many options and you really have to create a performance because there's no baked in performance um, with these instruments because, you know, it's not referencing an audio recording all the time. Uh, so that, that part I find a little bit difficult at times. But yeah, it's the trade-off. You want full control over the instrument, you got it, but um, it requires a little bit of sitting down and actually deciding what it is you want, what it is you like, what fits the piece, what fits the genre. It's like, you know, it's really entirely up to you and I like that. But so this is kind of where I wonder if this might be the future of sampling. Because traditional sampling has plateaued a little bit over the past couple of years. Because traditional sampling is always about compromise, right? Either you record more variations, more everything, but then that makes the product exponentially more expensive and it makes it heavier on the system, which makes it generally less accessible to most people, to the customers, because the most of the customers of sampling companies are semi-professionals, amateurs, hobbyists, you know, students that may not have the latest, greatest computer to run that stuff and that may not have the money to buy a really expensive library. Like this thing is actually really affordable. Uh, it's comparable to, you know, stuff like cinematic studio series and, you know, stuff like that. Um, so it's definitely not at the higher price end. But so with traditional sampling, the issue that you're facing then is you either make a really heavy library that most people can't afford and can't run on their systems, or you make a really light library, like you just, you know, cut things out to make it less expensive in the production, less expensive to sell, and then, um, you know, easier to run on systems and it'll appeal to a broader audience, but then you have the issue that people are gonna complain because they really wanted those 10 different legato transitions and they really wanted those 20 velocity layers or whatever, right? It's, it's a compromise all the time because these companies have to make money off of the product. And more is not necessarily better. I have libraries that are way heavier than others but sound worse because the more stuff you put in there, the more your samples are kind of in a perpetual state of crossfading. Imagine you have like 10 velocities 
in the sustains, right? And then you have non vibrato, vibrato espressivo, and you have like three different types of legato, and then legato round robins, and then different velocities in the legatos. You need release layers for all this stuff. Like, you'd be playing so many samples at the same time, and depending on what faders you're moving, you'd be cross-fading several samples into one another, um, which creates room pileup, phasing, frequency pileup, synthiness, all the stuff we don't want. Um, so bigger in a sample library doesn't necessarily mean better either. And then contact used to have group limits. I don't know if it still has that which also prevents you from just creating super bloated products, which is why a lot of sample developers have now created their own engines, of course, which has solved some issues, sure. But at the end of the day, you're tied to audio files with a baked in performance. Um, and there are just certain parameters or a lot of parameters that you cannot control unless the sample developer goes really ham on <laughs> on recording everything, but then you basically create a completely unusable product because which computer would be able to even run that and what engine would be able to run that. Like it would just be an editing and programming nightmare. And keeping players consistent over long periods of time is just not, it's not, everybody is human in the process. So it's not possible to be 100% uh, accurate all the time. So this could be a great future ahead if more companies get into this. I do worry a little bit about the future for musicians. Because if this gets really good, it could become a problem later down the line. Uh, so far with traditional sampling, I wasn't really worried about them because there are just too many compromises that have to be made in traditional sampling. With this, you don't really need to make compromises that much. So, I don't know. Um, there might be trouble on the horizon, but there might be trouble on the horizon anyway, because who knows what's gonna happen with like AI performance and stuff like that. Um, they might sell their performance. Like they might go into the studios with these companies and record their performance and their instrument and then create a preset like make artist presets for profit sharing. Um, that could be an option for musicians. Like at some point we might just have a library available to us with like <laughs> hundreds of musicians and their performance available. That would be kind of cool. Um, but yeah, there, had, there would have to be some kind of profit sharing model for those musicians for sure. And I mean, there's a lot of musicians already selling their uh, their performance to sample library companies, right? There are artist series already. So it's not that far-fetched, I guess. But it would be kind of cool to just have a library of actual, you know, captured performances by actual musicians one day. Um, but yeah, it's kind of um, maybe something that we all need to think about and think of a solution because we don't want to screw over musicians later down the line <laughs> by inventing virtual instruments that are just getting really convincing. I think this could be really cool for world instruments. World instruments have been really difficult to sample because of their different tuning and then also their different um, ornamentations and all this stuff. That could really work here with this technique because in traditional sampling, again, you would have to record so many snippets of audio and then make it a useful product that it's just kind of, you know, it gets bloated real fast and then it's not really a joy to use. I also just talked to a game developer and um, he had this uh, idea that maybe one day this might also be a really interesting thing to implement into game engines because maybe another collaboration. Um, because remember back, remember back in the day, when we were young, like in the 90s and 80s, when uh, video games were using MIDI instead of audio and they would just use your sound card to play back the MIDI, which made the music 100% interactive and kind of fun and interesting. Uh, not that cu current uh, game music is not interesting, but 
games kind of got more epic and cinematic and so they wanted cinematic sound to go with it and then tied themselves to audio and now you can still have a level of interactivity but not in the way that you could with MIDI files. So you're kind of limited in what you can do the moment you're using audio files. But so this could be kind of one day turn us back into sending MIDI to developers and having things like this play back the MIDI and then have true interactivity again. That would be kind of cool. Anyway, I'm really excited that this tech is finally going somewhere because I've been very underwhelmed with uh, the progress we've made in traditional sampling and I've been kind of waiting for something new. I said this in my live stream already that I'm kind of waiting for the next thing, someone to develop something that takes us further because I don't think the road is gonna get us much further in traditional sampling with the tools that we have. Either you'd have to invent some really, really great engine or, you know, figure out a way to capture audio in a different way or write scripts in a different way. But I don't see how with traditional sampling we can go that much further than we have come. So creating a hybrid approach to fill in all the gaps, right? You don't have three velocities with this instrument, you have infinite velocities, as you would with a real instrument. You have full control over the vibrato and legato, all of it, right? It plays a lot more like a real instrument uh, instead of, you know, referencing audio files, which again is always going to limit us if we do that. This could be the future of sampling if enough companies get into it and find new solutions and you know of course this all stands and falls with someone making a really convincing string product um, because without a working string section um, it's hard for anything to take over the market but yeah i kind of hope that maybe some of the traditional sample companies uh, with their resources get a little bit into this and see how far they can go with it especially the ones that already have their own player as well Though, as you can see, this one's using the UVI player, so you can clearly also just do it. The other sample modeling things are using contact, so you can also just use the traditional engines to do this. But I'm waiting for something, you know, to revolutionize what we're doing. And this might well be it, because I have never had this much flexibility in my writing. I didn't have to write to the strengths or weaknesses of the samples. I could just write without thinking about, oh, but, you know, is the sample good for that? Like, does this trill sound good? Does this sound good? Maybe this doesn't work with this, like, this legato transition doesn't sound good, so maybe I'll just change the melody. Like, I didn't have any of that. I was just writing, which is what I want to do. And ideally with fewer tracks, because I don't love having a thousand track template, okay? Like, it's a necessity for me, but if I can reduce it to like less than half the tracks, help me. <laughs> I'd like to uh, have less tracks and less resource hogs and free up my hard drives a lot more and free up the RAM more. Uh, so would be really cool to have like a whole orchestra with this. Um, not saying this product is entirely perfect, there are still some things, some frequency pileups or like volume imbalances that I've been fi fixing with Gullfoss and Neutron, whatever, I know how to fix stuff. You know, some, some of the second instruments don't sound as good as the first instruments, but whatever, I can make it work. And they keep updating stuff, so I'm not worried about any of this. But yeah, I'm excited. Like, this is the first time in a long time that I've gotten excited about where we might be going instead of just having the same tired old thing. So, yeah. Give them your money so they can develop more and faster. <laughs> I want the flutes and the strings. Make it happen. Anyway, I see you guys next time. And uh, happy Thanksgiving, Black Friday... Cyber Monday, whatever is happening right now. <laughs>